I knew I wanted to marry my wife and she was Catholic. And so uh, I was totally against being Catholic. I didn't want to become Catholic. I wanted nothing to do with the Catholic faith, all this stuff, because I listened to all the hype and I didn't do the research myself. Okay, and it wasn't until I started doing the research and finding out certain things like, um, who's got, you got a phone? Anybody got a phone that they can ask Google? Yeah, right here. Okay. Like an yeah, like, yeah. Okay, we're going to ask Google. Ask Google who founded the Catholic Church. Okay, Google. Okay, Google. Who founded the Catholic Church? Wow. According to Catholic tradition, the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ. Okay. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus said to St. Peter, Behold, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus put someone in charge of his church, and Jesus founded the Catholic Church. Now ask Google, who was the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church? Okay, so we know that St. Peter was left in charge and he built this church, so Christ founded it, right? <coughs> Ask Google who founded Calvary Chapel. Okay, Google. This is going to come up from search right? Who founded Cal Calvary Chapel? Calvary Chapel was founded by Chuck Smith. Okay, so you kind of get the idea where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> So every single Christian denomination that you ask Google who founded it, none of them say Jesus Christ except for this one, because every other Christian denomination broke off from this church through opinion, through whatever you have. Okay. Real. I want you guys to understand that humanity is we are a little puzzle piece to a much grander scheme of things. So there are powers much greater than us having a power play between each other and we're in the middle. Okay? So the devil is, the devil's goal is to confuse us and to um, what do you say? Uh, deceive all the nations, as the Bible will say. So I want you to understand that there is a role between these two plays. Children of light, God, Mary, Jesus, right? And darkness, okay? The ones that don't want to obey, the ones that want to rebel, the ones, okay? So I'm going to start this off. This is a new, I'm also an author. Uh, in the two years that I've been becoming Catholic, I've uh, wrote a couple of books. I have very, I have many more books on the way. I'm also uh, an evangelist. I'm in the Legion of Mary. I, we do door-to-door -door evangelization. We do apostolate tables. I do little talks like this. Uh, I've done one at St. Bonaventure Parish and several other little places here. And I'm just trying to make that grow more and more and more. I have a YouTube channel on apologetics on the Catholic faith because I have lots of friends who are Protestant who, who refuse to listen to certain things that uh, you know, the things that I was never allowed to look at. You're not allowed to look at the lives of the saints. It's crazy. Why do you, why do, you do that? That's not Jesus, whatever. So when you take people's words for it, you don't do the research yourself. You know, it, um, it leads you to not knowing everything. I can't reject something unless I know all the facts before I reject it, right? Like, it's like anything. We should just do, we need to do the research ourselves. And I'm telling you, if I didn't, if I found things as I dug in the church and dug in more history and dug and found things, are there corrupt things that happened? Yeah, there definitely are corrupt things that happened. But there was tons of corrupt things that happened to Judaism. All kinds of, you know, corruption in the temple. Corruption goes throughout history. It doesn't change who this house belongs to. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I mean? So, so... You know, when, how many people kind of know lots of the stories about Jesus, for the most part? 
Does everyone know about the story um, of the, the cleansing of the temple? Where Jesus walked into the temple, within the temple walls, they were, there were merchants and they were selling sacrifices, right? Because that's what they did. They sacrificed animals to Yahweh, to, the, to God, okay? And so they were inside the temple walls, which was this part of the, the temple has like an, a, a, the Holy of Holies, an inner sanctuary. Hello. And it has the Holy of Holies, which is God's dwelling place on earth the inner sanctuary, and then the outer part inside the temple walls. So they were in this part of the temple. And the Pharisees, because they had a lust of money and stuff, they wanted to make money and things like that. They had these guys inside selling stuff, and they would get a portion of the money, whatever. And so everyone knows the scene where everyone knows the scene where Jesus walks into the temple with the twelve apostles. And he sees everything that's going on, and what's he do? He grabs a, it, the Bible says, he grabs a whip of cords, he flips over the money changers, grabs a whip of cords, and chases everybody out of there. And what's he say to the Pharisees? He says, My father's house is a house of prayer. So it, so it didn't, it didn't ch- the corruption that was happening there didn't change who the house belonged to, right? Mm-hmm. And what did Jesus do? Mm-hmm. He cleansed the temple and made it clean again, right? So right now in this age, our church, Christ's church, is in an age of cleansing as well. Some bad stuff's been brought to light and God's getting rid of those things from our church. It's his church, okay? So when you hear people on the outside say stuff, bad things about you being Catholic, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're saying. They're just jumping on the bandwagon, okay? And if you knew enough, if you were equipped enough, you can have a good argument for them. And that's why I'm here. I want you guys, one of the biggest things that, that, that Protestants, problems, Protestants have is Mary. And they don't have all the facts. They don't understand. What, they think we worship her. We don't worship Mary. They think that, you know, that we hold her higher than we cannot honor Mary more than God has already honored her. it would be impossible be impossible he, he he did you know people say that Mary was chosen yes chosen but created for a purpose God you know us we have a need we get tired of washing dishes so we invent a dishwasher right God has a need for a specific purpose so he creates a creature for that purpose. Why? Because he can. He has that ability. That's who he is, right? So it was, it's so interesting. I came to a morning mass once with, <laughs> bless you, and it was on a Friday with the children there, the kids, little kids mass, right? It was uh, from all the school. They come over playing the drums and everything. It was really cool. And Father Ambrose was presiding and uh, he did something. I forget what the homily was about, but he asked people in the front row, he said, he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Asked them all. And then he had eh, all the little kids line up in a row and come up to him and tell him what he wanted to be when he grew up. Every single kid had something different to say. Notice that each individual child, each one of us, has different goals, aspirations, desires, wants. Because God puts that in us to... to we want to do what God wants for us. That's why you're all here, right? We want the blessings that God has for us. And in order for us to have those things, we have to walk the walk that he wants for us, right? So we can see, I could see from that mass with these kids all telling him the different career paths, the different things that they wanted to do when they grew up. Firefighters, police officers, a nurse, so and so and so. And then when you, I got an idea just from that mass of the fullness of our community, right? So understand that when, how important each and every one of you are to God because you contribute to the fullness of heaven. Does that make sense? That you guys contribute to the fullness of the fruition of God's plan for his kingdom because each of you 
play a significant role. Some really great ones, some really small ones, but God loves the little guy. I'm telling you right now, look at the lives of the saints. So many of them were screwed up all the time, did bad things, didn't follow him, didn't listen to him. And at some point, somewhere, they had a true encounter with Jesus Christ. A lived the living, and they knew for a fact who he was. Okay? So I want you so I want you to understand there's a contrast between good and evil. And I'm going to read about Mary. And in the beginning, it's a little messy because I talk about Satan a little bit. Okay? But the rest of the whole thing is basically the history of... Uh, it's not as a little bit. Okay? So, okay. so this is a book that I'm writing right now called A Walk Through the Mysteries. So I go through each mystery of the rosary and I explain the rosary. And, and the mysteries of the rosary. So in order for you guys to appreciate the rosary which while I can come another day or whatever, to appreciate the rosary because Mary gave us the rosary, right? It's, literally, it's from heaven. That's, it's a weapon for us to use. So I don't want to get too carried away. First, I need you to know who Mary is exactly. Have you, ever guys, have you guys ever heard of the saying, to Jesus through Mary? What was it? To, Jesus. to Jesus through Mary? Yeah, I've heard of Do, does that make sense to any of you? Um. It doesn't make, uh, yeah. Sort of? Not so, too much. So right. You could explain it. Though. Okay. Like, especially Protestants, they say, I don't need to go to Mary. I can go straight to God. Right? We do. We, we go straight. I have a relationship with Jesus, right? Outside of Mary, too. But the most powerful way that you can bring Christ into your life is through Mary. And I'm going to explain why and how. Okay? Okay. This is about the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do you guys believe that everything, every part of our faith needs to only come from the Bible? Or do you believe that you guys should look at the whole picture, including the Bible? Whole picture. Whole picture, right? Because our faith is like, is like, a, is like, is like a tree that grows in, into the sky, right? Okay, or like a river that goes forth and splits off and does different things. Okay, it's constantly moving, constantly growing, constantly doing things. And it can't just, God's work didn't stop when the Bible was done being written, right? And we can see this in the lives of the saints. If you look at all the writings of the saints in the Vatican, there's libraries full of them, full of them. It's crazy for us to not think that we, we shouldn't look at those things, okay? So I'm going to start off from this, and this is the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the crowning of Mary, which is quite biblical, even though others don't like to accept it. Whatever. Okay. So it's about four pages long, so bear with me. Um, are they welcome to uh, ask a question yes. or interrupt you yes. during, anytime, during your reading? Anytime. Like a, yeah. If you guys have a question about anything, raise your hand, okay? Or, or you can just say, out. yeah, just speak so out. Can, you're gonna reading. Okay? Just speak out, okay? Please. All right. In the beginning, God our Father put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between her seed and his seed. Genesis chapter 3. Enmity means rivalry. Mary's seed is Jesus Christ. All baptized Christians everywhere are members of Christ's body. This makes Mary the mother of Christ and also the mother of every member within Christ's spiritual body. Everyone got that? Okay. Because Jesus Christ is her child. Thus, a rivalry has been placed between Mary and Satan in the beginning, since Genesis. I will put enmity between you, because you have done this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's a devil. He's kind of right. He was talking to God, is talking to the devil. But remember, God's outside of time. The past and present and the future, there's no concept. He's, he can be wherever at once. It doesn't make sense that he was saying, I put a rivalry between you and Eve, even though Eve was already on his side, and it's not her, right? That Eve. Okay. Mary's seed. <laughs> Everywhere. Oh, excuse me. This makes Mary the mother of Christ and also the mother of every member in Christ's spiritual body because Jesus is her child. Thus a rivalry has been placed between Mary and Satan. 
between her seed, Jesus the Christ, and all the members within his spiritual body. By truth, justice, righteousness, kindness, love, generosity, humility, and holiness. Satan's seed, however, is all those who were slaves, who are slaves to the iniquity of their sins. The children of Mary, within the body of Christ, who are the children of God, against Satan's seed, the children of iniquity. They will be against God's commands and much of what Jesus taught in his church. Jesus identifies Mary as the woman at the wedding feast at Cana, John chapter 2. Jesus also identifies Mary as the woman just before he died on the cross, Mm -hmm. giving Mary to all disciples of his as their mother, identifying John, his disciple, as Mary's son and Mary as his mother. Quote, When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. End quote. Notice that Jesus identifies Mary again as the woman and identifies her as the mother of his disciple. In the book of Exodus, God instructed Moses to build an ark with specific instructions on how to build it. Quote, They shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. This is God speaking to Moses. Mm -hmm. You shall overlay it and you shall make it a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten on them their feet. So and so and so. Other side. You shall make the pole. Okay, hold on. So they can carry the ark. The pole shall remove the ark. Remove from it. Okay. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat out of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Does anyone know what a cherubim is? It's an angel. It's a type of angel. God's asking Moses to construct two cherubims to put them on top of the ark with a chair there. Like two statues. Like, basically, yes. So when people tell you, well, why do we have statues of angels and things like that? Tell them, well, why did God tell Moses to make statues of angels on the Ark of the Covenant? Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you tell, and then I want you to think of this. How did Moses know what a cherubim looked like unless God showed him? Mm. That's where we get where angels look like. Okay? One, One place. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony which I will give you, the Ten Commandments, yeah. okay? which is God's law, right? The logos. Okay. There I will meet with you, and from, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Did Moses already communicate with God without the ark? Yeah, he did, right? He, they were led out of Egypt. He went up to Mount Sinai. He had the, the Ten Commandments made, right? But here, God's telling him, you need to sit in this chair on top of the ark between these two angels and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to speak to you there. So, is his prayer, God's instructing Moses to talk to him through the ark, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. This ark and its use was meant to be the most profound way to meet and communicate with God, to receive instruction from him. Moses already communicated with God without the ark. Yet here the Lord our God is instructing Moses and us that the most powerful way to communicate with him, to receive instruction from him, is to come to him from the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. 
The Ark was also used to store God's law, the Lagos, the Ten Commandments. This is the testimony that God spoke of giving to Moses. The Ark was also used to store the manna, which was the bread from heaven that God provided for the Israelites each day in the desert that fed them for 40 years. Does everyone know that story? They didn't have bread, and then God made bread appear every morning. Okay. Do you know that story? The manna? Did they get tired of it? Too? They did. They complained a lot. They did, quite a bit. Yeah. So they, all they were eating was quail and stuff because God made quail appear every day to eat, but then they wanted bread, but they didn't have bread. So every morning God made this flaky substance on the ground appear, and they would collect it and make bread out of it. That was called manna from heaven because it was from God, right? And so, and it would rot at the end of the day, right? So they wouldn't store it. He told them not to store it, right? Until once they reached their promised land, correct? Then he, there was a batch that when they kept it in the ark, it wouldn't rot. Does anyone know why God did that? Why he made it rot at the end of the day? Yes. Sure. Well, why did he make it rot at the end of the day? Well, I was going to say, my, my theology teacher in high school may be even more narcissistic, but he said so they could be a dependency on him. Correct. To show that he'd provide. That's Correct. It. That's it. So they would depend on God. Completely. So they wouldn't store it up. So they wouldn't say... I have this here. I don't need to pray for you to right now. I don't need to ask you for anything. God wants us to depend on Him. God wants us to be right there. But that's what trust is, right? If I have nothing and I want you to send me where you want me to go, that's why Jesus says, give up all you have, kind of thing, right? Okay? So it can't be taken from you or whatever. But because that's, 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 that's true trust. If I do this and you drop me, I will fall. So I'm trusting you that you won't. <laughs> okay. This trust, right? Sure. They, mm, I don't know. I think they tried and it rotten. Yeah, they would get worms. Yeah, yeah, they got worms. They tried, but it won't get mm -hmm. rotten. Yeah. Until later, they got to the promised land and then, so how does people, how does, how does, how do the Jews, how does the Israelites know who God is? How do they know? Because yeah, because right, God, there, because God, when we went with them in Egypt, He came down from the sky in a pillar of cloud, and He stayed there with them in a tabernacle. This is what a tabernacle was called. This is where we get the name from, where we keep the body of Christ, right? And so, and when the cloud would leave, the Israelites would pack up and they would move on. When the cloud would, when they would take a rest and break, and the cloud would come down, they would stay there until the cloud got up and left again. And and this whole time Moses was in the tabernacle communicating with God. They would he would do there are all kinds of different things. So the Jews know who God is for sure. Okay. And several times throughout the Bible, you know, different prophets like Elijah rain fired down from anyway, there was a big test. Okay, so they know who God is for sure, right? That's how and so when they got to Jerusalem and they built the temple there, God came to the Holy of Holies in the center of the temple and stayed there. So God was on earth in that sanctuary where only certain priests could go. You had to be very clean, like, the, you know, not exactly, sort of, yes, that too, yes, you have chosen, yes, from the blood of Aaron, right? So from the bloodline of Aaron, from, from Moses' brother, Aaron. God appointed that bloodline to be priests for him. So Zechariah was a prophet and his son, John the Baptist, were both from the bloodline of Aaron, which means John the Baptist would have been trained to be a temple priest. 
that's why he was out in the Jordan River washing people because that's what they do when they come into a temple. They wash, right? He, he should have been in the temple, but he wasn't. That's why people caught all this. That's why people got all this, uh, um, uh, you know, that's why he drew so much atten- attention. Here's this guy who's supposed to be a temple priest, whose father is a prophet, not in the temple, out of the Jordan River, submersing people. They didn't know, but they just washed their feet, their hands, and their head, and then they walked into the temple. It's, what is he talking about? That's why he caught so much attention, right? So, sorry, I sidetracked there, but... Okay. So the man... Okay. Okay, manna, which was the bread from heaven that God provided for the Israelites each day in the desert that fed them for 40 years. Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer full of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout our generation. So he took a little bit, he put it before God, and he made it, preserved it forever, never rotted again. And they put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. So inside of the Ark, with the mercy seat on top, is God's law, the Ten Commandments, and the bread from heaven, right? Both are from God, right? Okay? Both are from God, okay? From Scripture, we can derive that the Ark of the Covenant was given to Moses as the most powerful way of communicating and receiving instruction from God. God's holy law was also stored inside the Ark, as was the bread from heaven, the manna. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven, quote, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. John chapter 6. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. God's holy law. The logos in human form. Quote, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John chapter 1. So the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? Quote, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Everyone got that? Okay. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John chapter one. Okay. So Jesus is the word of God. He's God's law. He's the Ten Commandments. He's the Logos in human form. He's the bread from heaven, right? Because he said so, right? Okay. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was made by human hands, so, so too Mary was made by her parents, Joachim and Anne. The manna, the bread from heaven, and God's law goes, the Ten Commandments, both came from God. Just as the bread and the law came from heaven, so too Jesus the Christ, the Word made flesh, the bread from heaven came down to us and was held in Mary's womb. Luke chapter 1. Making Mary the Ark of the New Covenant. Okay. Matthew chapter 26. Thus Mary has become the new mercy seat of the ark. Right? Did Moses communicate without the ark to God? He did. He prayed to God. They led him up out of Egypt, right? And then God had him build the ark and make built the mercy seat. And from that mercy seat, it was the most profound way he could communicate with him, right? And Mary is the ark. So God instructed Moses to speak to him through the ark. So that's why we speak to God through Mary. She is the new mercy seat of the ark, of the new ark of the covenant. Right? I'm sorry, it's kind of like foreshadowing uh, Abraham and Isaac, the sacrifice. This is foreshadowing Mary and Jesus in Mary, Jesus in her womb. Right? Yes, 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 I got him, I got him, yeah. So, much, Mary obtained much of what they asked. Okay, hold on. Superseding the Ark of the Covenant. Of, so, thus Mary has become the new mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, superseding the Ark of the Covenant of the Old. Thus, through Mary, one will obtain much of what they ask for from Jesus. Because Jesus is God. Correct? Okay. Because prayer through Mary is the most powerful way to communicate and receive instruction from God her son, Jesus Christ. 
Oke. Halo. Hah? Ya. Sure. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about Mary right now. Yeah. So we're talking about why do we say? Uh, I'm basically giving you a rundown on who Mary is and her significance in the role of our salvation with Jesus and God's plan. Okay. So um, we we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant and that God instructed Moses to create the Ark. Are you aware of the story? Okay, and on top of the ark, he had him build the mercy seat. Do you know what that is? God instructed Moses that to build a mercy seat on top of the ark between two angels, and he would sit there, and there he would speak to him and give him instruction on what he should do with the Israelites, right? Did Moses pray to God without the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, he did. So he did have a dialogue with God because he told him how to build the ark, <laughs> right? But here God is telling him to use the ark to pray to him, to speak to him, to talk to him, right? And in the ark was the Ten Commandments and the manna, the bread from heaven. Well, Jesus is the, is, the new, is the law of God. And he's the bread from heaven because he said so. And he was stored in Mary, which makes Mary the ark of the covenant, right? So she's the new mercy seat. That's why we ask Mary to pray with us to her son, right? Because it's the most powerful form of communicating with God. Does that make sense? Because she's, she's superseding the Ark of the Old Covenant because she's the Ark of the New Covenant. Okay. Continue. 